Now, in the book of Acts here in chapter 11, of course, we're picking right back up from chapter 10. And um, I'm not going to recap too much of chapter 10. Peter does enough of that here in chapter 11. But basically, he gets back from Cornelius. Cornelius and all his house got saved in chapter 10. Um, and that whole chapter was just about one story about the animals being, you know, coming down basically in a balloon, in, a, in like a hot air balloon type of thing. Um, and Peter being told that they're not, you know, called nothing um, common or unclean, that God hath cleansed, and God, you know, God is showing all that unto him. So now Peter's returning from his, from his journey there. And in verse number one, it says, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So they heard what happened there. In verse two, it says, And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. So contended, I mean, they, they confronted him, and they're like fighting with him, they're arguing with him, saying, hey, you know, what are you doing going over to the Gentiles? Like, why are you going and preaching unto them? And we see here that that, that false doctrine was spread pretty wide. Because you remember, Peter had said in the previous chapter that um, it was unlawful to go unto one of another nation and to eat with, with uh, basically with a stranger, with a foreigner. That it was unlawful to do that. And I explained last week. How that, that's not one of God's laws. That was just a man-made law. That was just a law of the Pharisees. But it seems like it was something that was commonly uh, believed. right? It was something that was just kind of commonly accepted in their culture and among, and among the people back then, among the Jews of this time. Because they come up to Peter then when they hear that he was up, just up there and preaching unto them, just like, what are you doing? And it says in verse number 3, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didn't eat with them. So that would take an issue with the fact that he went in and, and ate with uncircumcised men, with, the, with these Gentiles. And um, then it says in verse 4, Peter explains what happened. It says, but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning. Rehearsed just means like he was telling it to them. Um, he was telling it again. He was just saying that, okay, look, this is what happened. We're not going to go through this entire thing because we just read it um, basically like twice in the last chapter. But he, he just recounts everything that happened to him. And they said, you know, I came here, they saw an angel, you know, this is what happened, I preached unto them, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. And um, we'll skip down to, to verse number 13. It says, well, let's look at number 12. It says, And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Now, I didn't really spend very much time or make too much of a mention on this point last time because we don't see these exact words that we see here. When Peter's telling the story, it says um, at the end of verse 13, or 14, I'm sorry, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. In, um, in the previous chapter, I believe it said that you should tell them what you, know, what you must do. Right? It didn't say anything about salvation specifically. But here we see in chapter 11 that that's exactly what it was. And I kind of, I kind of drew the correlation a little bit last time. But um, basically, this is the same exact thing that happened to Saul. Right? He saw the vision, except it was Jesus Christ talking with him. Um, in this situation with Cornelius, there's an angel. But Jesus Christ talked to Saul, and he says, you know, go and, um, and talk to, um, oh, what's his name? Well, i got so many names. No, I'm going to have to look it up. No, I'm not going to look it up. Anyways, he goes, go and talk to this guy. My mind is totally blank right now. But I'm going to get in a second. And he's going to tell you what you're going to need to do. And it was the same exact verbiage that we saw in chapter 10. Um, and that's when... Um, man, what are the names? This is going to drive me insane. Though. I think it was Ananias. Um, I believe it was Ananias. But um, in any case... Saul goes to this man and, and, you know, and he tells him you know, to basically be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And that's when, that's when Saul gets saved. And here we see it's the same thing. An angel appears on the Cornelius and he says, okay, look, I'm going to tell you, you know, send for Peter 
tells him by name, said for Simon, whose surname is Peter, and he's going to tell you what things that you need to do in order to be saved. Now, God's hand is obviously in all of this. Obviously, I mean, he's being met by an angel, just like Saul was met with Jesus Christ in the way. But think about this. What would have happened, even though God's hand is all this, God's orchestrating this, God's leading this, God's leading Peter, God's you know, telling Peter, you know, hey, go with these guys. Don't doubt. Just go with them. You know, um, and, and this whole amazing thing happens that's recorded in the Bible. But what would have happened if Peter decided just to resist the Spirit? When the, Peter, when the Spirit said, hey, go with these guys and don't doubt anything. If Peter just, just said, no, no, I'm not going to go with them. Or, you know, I'm too lazy, I got some other things to do, I want to go out fishing tomorrow morning, or whatever it may be. And he just decided not to do it. That would have changed the story completely, obviously, but um, the angel didn't tell Cornelius how he was going to be saved. He just said, send for Simon Peter, he'll tell us how to be saved. And that was Peter's job. That was, that was a job that God had designated for Peter. What would happen if Peter just didn't go? Would those men still have gotten saved? I mean, Cornelius and all his household, would they have gotten saved? Don't know. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know, but here's the thing. God had this job assigned for Peter. The same way God has a job assigned for every single one of us today to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And there are people here just like this Cornelius that are just waiting to hear it. Okay, and the Spirit is telling all of us that we need to go. Jesus Christ commanded us that we need to go. Now, thank God Peter obeyed the Spirit. Peter obeyed the voice of God. Peter obeyed and went and preached the gospel unto these people, and they received it, and they got saved. And it, and it was an amazing event. But see, God's working in your life too. God's working in our life. And you're probably not going to hear an audible voice maybe as Peter did, that said to go with these people. But you know what? You're going to hear a voice from, from the words of these books that are telling you to go. And they are telling you, we, we already know. See, Peter had to be taught from, directly from God about, about um, going unto the Gentiles since it was something that they hadn't done before and that they're doing now. And it was, it was kind of a change for them. And God spelled it out for them. But we have, we have the same message today. Okay, and this is the Spirit still living on and telling us all to go out. And here's the thing. If you don't go out, I'll guarantee you, you know, I mean, people are not going to get saved. That, that God has designated for you to go out and win to Christ. If you don't go out and do that, maybe the people may say it, maybe they won't. But here's the thing. The less people that are going out soul winning, I mean, you can only reach so many people. So, guaranteed, there's people that, that would have gotten saved. When people decide not to go out sowing, not to dedicate, dedicate any time unto God, not to spend the time out in, in, in preaching Jesus Christ on these people, there are some people that are going to die and go to hell because Christians just decided not to go out sowing. It's just as simple as that. God can do miracles. God can do all these things. But the thing is, God's not going to get these people saved just because he's going to appear to them and they're going to get saved. It didn't happen with Saul and it didn't happen with Cornelius. He had other men go to preach unto them, but he didn't do it himself. And that's, it's, it's our job. And I, and I preach about this. You know, if it sounds like I'm a broken record, it's because this is so important. It's because the Bible talks about this over and over again. I mean, here we see again, the, I mean, the whole book of Acts, how much soul winning is going on in the book of Acts. I mean, this is the Acts. This is the actions of the disciples, of the apostles. You want to be a disciple of Christ? Hey, you need to have some actions. You need to have some works. If you don't have the works, your faith is dead, the Bible says. We already know that we're saved and we're going to heaven. It has nothing to do with that. But your faith is dead if you're not doing the works. And one of the biggest works that we could be doing is going out and preaching the gospel of every creature. And people, it's sad, but you think about it and realize it. Some people are going to go to hell when you decide not to go out soul winning. Because who else is going is to bring it to them? It's not like we have an overabundance of soul winners going out and knocking on doors. I mean, how many people have you ever had come and knock at your door and bring the gospel? I've had one person in my entire life come with the correct gospel. One. Now, and that was, that was a lot later in my life, too. That was a lot more recently. So, like, I mean, for, for decades, 
not one person has ever come and knocked on my door that had the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is not an overabundance. There, there is not too many people going out and doing this. It's our job, and we all need to take it seriously, just as Peter did. And thank God that Peter listened to God, listened to the Spirit. He didn't disobey. He didn't refuse. He didn't get an attitude in his heart of, of disobedience and just say, nah, I don't, that's far. I don't, really, I don't want to go to job. I wasn't planning on going there. I'm hungry. I just want to eat some food and go to bed. That's not what he was thinking. He said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? I'll go do it. Even if he's met with resistance, he'll do it. Doubting nothing. Doing something he's never done before. Going, you know, going unto, uh, going unto the, the Gentiles. Something he's been taught the whole time that he, he wasn't supposed to do, but you know what? He heard it from God. Something he's been trained and taught his whole life and something that he believed he wasn't supposed to do up until he heard it from God. Okay. Okay, God, I'll go do it. That's the attitude that we ought to have, just like Peter had. Let's look down here in verse number 15. Because he's continuing on with the story now. It says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? So here is explaining to them, to you know, the the story, he's, he's wrapping up the story here saying, look, I preached unto him, and, and as I was preaching, the Holy Ghost fell upon him. And he's, I remember, Jesus said, um, or, yeah, he said the word of the Lord. Jesus said that John baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You're going to be immersed with the Holy Ghost, with the power of the Holy Ghost, and that's why they're going to be able to you know, speak with other tongues and heal people and do all these great miracles because they were just immersed with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon them. And as he preached on the Gentiles, see, God gave him this confirmation that what he was doing was right. It was a brand new thing. And, and God gave him the confirmation. And as he was speaking, when they put their faith in Christ, hey, the Holy Ghost fell on them too. And they were able to speak with other tongues and do this miracle. So then he's like, so he's, he's using this and just telling them, like, look, for as much as God gave them the light gift as he gave unto us. And by the way, again, he says, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Holy Ghost was given to them that believe. And it was given to them before they were even baptized. Baptism has nothing to do with the giving of the Holy Ghost. And um, this is the power of the Holy Ghost upon him. He says, he says, what was I that I could withstand God? Right? He's like, I'm not going to not do this. God's the one who's doing it. Right? God's the one who's given the Holy Ghost. They believed. And, and the Holy Ghost fell upon them. So he's, he's kind of just convincing them and, and just explaining to them, look, this is what happened. And, um, and the Holy Ghost came upon these people just like it came on us. And he's saying there really is no difference between them and us because they got saved just like we got saved. And then they, they understand this. Look at verse 18. It says, when they heard these things, they held their peace. So they stopped contending with them, they stopped arguing with them, and glorified God saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. You said, well, then God's given it to them too. It's not just for us. They stopped off, they heard, and said, fine, um, we believe you. Now I'm going to park it here for a minute because they hear the story of Peter, right? They hear the story of Peter preaching to the Gentiles and then believing and receiving the Holy Ghost. That's, that's exactly what he said. That's exactly what he said. Then they say that God has granted to the Gentiles repentance. Nowhere did Peter once mention anything about repentance. Peter didn't say, and they repented, and they did anything like that. So what we see from this story here, first of all, is that when they recognize that they believed on Christ and received the Holy Ghost just like they did because they believed, when they see this, they, they said, they, they recognize that as repentance unto life. Notice, nowhere in this entire story is it talking about their works and, and how sorry they were for their sins. And, and, you know, you don't see in Peter's preaching here just, just digging into them and being like, you're so horrible, you have all these awful sins, you know, you're disgusting, you're vile. But you know what? That's what these preachers do that, that preach a false repentance gospel. 
that say, you have to be so sorry for all of your sins, and you have to just, just be brought super low, and just understand that you're dirt, and you're a worm, and that you're nothing, and before you can even accept Jesus Christ, is that what happened in this story at all? Do we get that, that type of event happening whatsoever? Not even close to it. In fact, we're going we're to take a look at this. Let's look at this right now. I've got a few more things I want to say, but um, we're going to flip back real quick to Acts chapter 10 because we're going to review everything that Peter preached unto them and see where they're getting, you know, what, what repentance truly is. And we're going to park on repentance because it's such a big issue today and people have such a hard time understanding what repentance really is. See, so many people these days will say that repentance is turning from sin. They define repentance as just automatically having to do with sin. And that is not true. It's the farthest thing from the truth. Repentance sometimes is associated with sin, and sometimes it's not. But the word repent itself, or repentance, does not automatically have anything to do with sin. You have to read it in context. So first of all, people just have to understand what the definition of repentance is. Look it up in the Bible. When God's repenting, okay, I guarantee you he's not turning from any sin. That's the last thing that's happening. God has no sin. So, so if you have that notion that repenting automatically has to do with something with sins, get it out of your head because it's false. You've been brainwashed. You've been taught falsely. It's not true. And um, people say you have, to, you have to at least be willing to turn from your sin as if you're trusting in your sins in order to be saved. Which is silly too because it's not like, it's not like an unsaved person is thinking that, well, I'm just trusting in how much I sin and how much I love sin to go to heaven. Because why would you have to turn from your sins to the Savior? That doesn't make any sense. To say like, turn from trusting in, in your sin in order to trust in Jesus? No. It's just, it's just all these um, man-made doctrines and man-made lies that are told about repentance. And it, they, you know, these people will go further to say that you can tell if a person truly repented based on their works. And they'll say that, well, they must not have been saved because they're not doing anything for Christ. They didn't really repent of their sins. Oh, he was, he was, a, he was a drunk and then, and then he claims to have gotten saved, but now he's still drinking alcohol. They'll say he didn't repent, which is a damnable heresy because then that would mean that in order for that person to get saved, you just have to give up, your, you have to give up drunkenness. You have to obey the law. And, and it's, it's a falsehood, my friend. It's not true. Now, where in this story, we're going to look at, where in the story that Peter told them, did it say anything about how wicked and sinful Cornelius was and, and that he just needs to turn from that or, or how he trembled and fell on his knees at the preaching of Peter and decided to turn his entire life over to God? We see that nowhere in the story. I, and, I'm, and actually, it's contrary because when the Bible talks about Cornelius, it basically says he was a pretty good guy. It says that, that he gave alms and he prayed to God, right? I mean, he was trying to do what was right. Now, he wasn't saved, but it wasn't saying that he was just some, some horrible, wicked sinner that, that you know, um, just, just needed to feel this, you know, this repentant heart of, of being able to turn his life over to God, which is not salvation anyways. When you make God, Jesus, the Lord of your life and decide to obey him, that is a works-based salvation that is not salvation by grace through faith. See, Peter didn't even say anything about repentance. They deduced that from his story. And um, his story was about this man. In, in Acts 10, 2, it said, A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Right? This is talking about Cornelius. This is the same man Peter preached the gospel to. Now, what did Peter say to him? Let's look at Acts 10, 38. We're going to review this real quickly and, and just specifically looking for what is he saying to him because this is where he's preaching the gospel to him. 10, 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, okay, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing, all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He explains who Jesus was, right? Jesus was, he was ordained by God. He did good. He healed. God was with him, right? This is exactly what we preach to people when we go out knocking on doors and talking to people, right? Hey, explain a little bit about who Jesus was. He was the son of God. He was God in the flesh. He healed people. He raised the dead. He, you know, God was with him. He proved, you know, he, he used them mightily to do these miracles. 
Verse 39, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. So now he's getting to the death part. He said, okay, we witnessed all this stuff. We saw it. We were there for it. This stuff is true. And then he says that, but the Jews, they killed him and they hung him on the tree. They crucified him. Verse 40, him, God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. This is exactly what Peter is preaching. Is he saying anything so far? He hasn't said, mentioned anything about Cornelius' sins and how wicked he is and, and how he has to turn from his sins in order to trust the Savior. Verse 41. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God. So he explained, look, he didn't, he didn't show himself openly to every single person. They only showed us us. Look at verse 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. So here we see where they are saying that Jesus Christ is the judge. Okay? And that people will be judged. Um, but he doesn't really go into detail about it very much at all. He just says that, that Jesus Christ was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead, of the people who are alive and dead. Um, this is as close as we're going to get in this story to him talking about Cornelius' sin. We know Cornelius had sin. Everybody has sin. He didn't harp on it and, 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 and you know, dig into it as these people who preach this repentance and this, this attitude that you have to have and how low you have to be brought in order to turn from all of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. He didn't do it. This is as close as you're going to get. He says, he ordained him to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Look at verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Your sins will be forgiven. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Do you see much difference between what Peter is saying to, to Cornelius and the men that were there and what, and what we do when we go out and preach the gospel? Because I don't. We, we explain who Jesus Christ is. We tell about the miracles. We tell him he was God in the flesh. We say, look... Jesus was real. He did all these things. He was crucified. He was dead. He rose again three days later. He's the judge, but you can be saved. Your sins can be forgiven by believing in him. Whosoever believeth in him. This is exactly what Peter just preaches to him. And what happens? They believe they got saved because the Holy Ghost fell upon them. And they received the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, it didn't take them to hear much before they believed. I'm sure they had heard other things before. I mean, they probably had people, you know, they probably heard things in the past. But at this moment, this is what they needed to hear in order to get saved. And they did get saved. Yet people are going to mock you if you say that you get somebody saved after talking with them for 10 minutes. I hear this criticism and this mockery all the time. And it, and it makes me sick. Because these are people typically who spend zero time out soul winning. Yet they're going to criticize you and say, oh, it's such a big life event, which it is. Getting saved, yeah, of course it is, because your entire eternity has changed forever. But they'll say, you can't tell me that if you talk to someone for 10 minutes, that they're just going to make this monumentous change in their life and believe on Jesus Christ and then just get saved because you talked to them for 10 minutes. Well, isn't that exactly what happened with Cornelius? I think that's less than 10 minutes. It didn't take us very long to read what Peter was preaching unto them before they believed and got saved. He preached the gospel unto them which is what anybody needs to hear to get saved. And anybody can do that. It doesn't have to take you two years or ten weeks or however long of all this studying and thinking and meditating and all this other stuff to get saved. It just has to take one time of you hearing the Word of God and accepting it and believing it and putting your faith in Christ. <coughs> That's all it takes to get saved. Whether it takes five minutes or five years is inconsequential. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in being extremely thorough with people because I want to make sure that they understand it. If you just blow through the gospel and just, and just say, Jesus Christ, you know, he died, he rose again, and do you believe on him to get saved? You know, and just, just have people repeat a prayer. That's not what we do here. I don't believe in that for a second. But what, I'm, what the point I'm trying to make here is that Peter was preaching, and, and he wasn't even done before these people... Had you know had put their faith in Christ? People can get saved fast, and, and and some people may take longer. 
It might be different, but you can't criticize someone for going out and preaching the gospel. And when they say, when a person confesses with their mouth the Lord Jesus, and we believe that they believe in their heart that he's raised up from the dead. We don't know that for sure. I don't have a magnifying glass. I can't look into their heart. But God knows their heart. But if somebody's going to confess with their mouth, after listening to the gospel, after listening to the Bible, and, and it sounds like they have a pretty good comprehension of the free gift, and they're not trusting in their own works, and they call upon God, then what's going to lead me to think that they don't put their faith, they didn't put their faith in Christ and get saved? There's nothing. Yet, we continually hear and get attacked for our soul winning methods, and, and you know, it's not from anyone inside of church, but there's so many naysayers out there else that they just want to bring soul winning down. Ultimately, it's usually what it is. It's usually just people, they're not doing anything themselves, so they're going to try to tear down people who are trying to do something. The biggest critics of soul winning are those that do nothing. Those that do nothing for God. They think they're doing something because they go to church once a week. And, may, and they'll sit through a sermon or something, and, and maybe they'll talk about God with their friends sometimes. But they're not going out. They're not talking to strangers. They're not visiting the fatherless and the, wid and the, and the widows. They're not, they're not doing any of this stuff. And they're going to condemn you for doing it and say, Oh, yeah, if these people were really saved, then how come they're not in your church? Because coming to church doesn't make you saved. <laughs> Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ makes you saved. Lots of people can put their faith in Christ and never can step foot into this church. That doesn't make them unsaved. I mean, what about Cornelius? Do you, do you think Cornelius went down to Jerusalem and went to church every day there with Peter? I mean, how, how would he even know? Oh, you mean he didn't make... Hey, if he was really saved, he would make that journey from Joppa to Jerusalem every week. That's ridiculous, but that's, that's the type of nonsense that you'll hear these naysayers say. Now, I don't see anywhere where Peter hammered them about their sins. I don't see, you know, where he really made sure that they were truly repenting of their sins. It's not in the story at all. It's not existent. The repentance that they needed, which is exactly what was recognized, was to believe on Christ, which is exactly what they did. They didn't believe in Christ before. They had to hear about it, and they had to change their belief system from whatever they were trusting before, whatever they were believing in before, to believe on Christ and get saved. And that was the repentance that they did, and that's exactly why, why they got saved. Now, where does this false doctrine even come from? I'm going to go to a few verses that people use, because you think of, where, where does it even come from? It just, it, at first and foremost, that's why I mentioned the definition of repentance, because people just have a, a false understanding of what the word even means. It's just a simple definition, and people just automatically associate it with sin. So some of the verses I use is like Matthew 4, 17, um, says from, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They'll use a verse like that and say, See, you have to, you have to repent of your sins. You have to give up your sinful life in order to be saved. From that verse, the verse says nothing about eternal life. He just says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he says, repent. Never mentioned sin one time. Not once. It's just, just the word repent. Mark 1.15 clears it up a little bit. Same account. It says, in saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. That's a much more clear verse saying, repent, repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, what people will say here too is that they'll say, oh, see, they're two different things. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And they'll, they'll try to use the and there as a, as a conjunction of, of two separate ideas. But that's not true here. For one, it says, repent ye, comma, and believe the gospel, which is a restating of repent ye. But even without that comma, the word and can be used, like where it says, um, God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not talking about two different people. It's talking about the same one. Yet that word and is used right in between those two. Um, it's just restating the same exact thing, which is exactly what he did here. Repent ye and believe the gospel. But that's one of the verses that they'll point to. Go, if you would, to Luke 13, because this is another passage that they like. They'll like to use Luke 13, verse number 1. I'm not going to spend too much more time on the subject, but 
it just kind of burns me up when, when, when I hear this, because this, this false doctrine is, is very prevalent in Baptist churches, and, and among, among a lot, actually among a lot of churches, even just, just false denominations, people who are, um, you know, so many people just repeat that phrase, repent of your sins. You have to believe on Jesus Christ and repent of your sins to be saved. And, and it's, it's falsehood. That's a works-based salvation. Luke 13, verse 1, this is another verse, of the, the, another scripture that they like to use. It says, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, <laughs> whose blood Pilate had, Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So they'll say, see, look, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. That must mean it's talking about salvation, right? First of all, they're overlooking that word likewise. That word likewise is very important in understanding the scriptures. That except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. What does likewise mean? In the same way, in the same manner, the same way that they died, hey, that's how you're going to die. And what was he talking about? He's talking about their physical death, right? There was a tower in Siloam that fell upon a bunch of people. And then the other one was the Galileans, it says, whose um, blood Pilate had mingled with the sacrifices. Like Pilate had killed some people, right, of Galilee, and mingled their blood with their sacrifices. So there's a couple things that Jesus is teaching here. One, they're saying, he's saying like, what, do you think that they were, they were even worse sinners just because these bad things happened to them? You know, a lot, of, a lot of people in those days, and even today, will think that, oh, these bad things are happening to you, then you must not be right with God, which isn't always necessarily true, but sometimes it is true. But he's saying, look, they weren't sinners of, like more than everybody else just because these things happened to them. He says, and he's telling them, look, unless you repent, you're going to likewise perish. And here's the thing, if you're living in sin, if you're living in wickedness, if you're a saved man, but if you're living in sin and just, and just doing wicked things, God can take you out. God can cause a tower to fall on, on top of you and kill you. And he's saying, look, if you don't change your way, if you don't change, if you don't repent, if you don't turn, you're going to likewise perish. And you see, here's the thing. Again, sin isn't mentioned in this passage, one way or the other. I'm just trying to explain that. Look, there's a lot of ways of looking at these things. And you really have to look at the context to understand clearly what is he even talking about. What does repent refer to here? Because here's the thing. Repent very many times can be talking about sin. And it does. And we're going to turn to, we'll turn to Revelation chapter 2, if you would. Because here's an instance where, where repenting is talking about sins. In Revelation chapter number 2. But it's not always talking about sins. When it says repent, you believe the gospel. It's not talking about sins. It's talking about your belief. It's talking about your faith. And I'll tell you what, every time that the Bible refer, uses the word repent, when it's, regard, when it's regarding salvation or eternal life, it's always talking about believing. It's always talking about putting your faith in Christ and stop believing in false gods and false religions, which is why the majority of the time, you'll notice this, the majority of the time, that, that you'll see the word repent even being used in regard to salvation, Jesus Christ or whoever's speaking is talking to the Pharisees. Or he's talking to the Sadducees. He's talking to the false prophets. He's talking to the people who believe and that were steeped in the false religion. Hey, the Catholic or the Mormon or the, the Pentecostal, in order for them to get saved, they can't be a Catholic anymore. They can't be a Mormon anymore. They can't be a, a Pentecostal anymore. They can't believe in that false doctrine, that false religion anymore. You have to believe on the true Lord Jesus Christ. Does that mean they'll always just stop attending that church? No, but they're not going to be a Catholic anymore if they, if they put all their faith in Christ because they're not trusted in works. By definition, they're, they're no longer a Mormon or whatever they are if they do that. Now look at Revelation chapter 2. It says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So here, Jesus is talking, he's sending a message to his church, and he's saying, look, you have to repent. And how do you repent? By doing the first works. 
Right here, it's very clear that the word repent is, is, is clearly talking about works. Okay, and this is why it's so important just to get the context. Now, does the word repent always have to do with works? No. But in this situation, it absolutely does. And see, people out there like to have it one way and one way only and just say, repent means to turn from your sins. If that's the case, that's, that's the work space. And this is what... This church was sinning because they left their first love, and Jesus said, you need to remember from where you're falling. You need to repent. You need to do the first works. He says, I'm going to remove your candlestick. You're no longer going to be a church. I'm no longer going to recognize you as a church. Your candlestick's going to be removed unless you repent and do the works. It's important to understand this in context. Now, we're going to move off. Go back to Acts chapter 11, if you would. We're almost done with the sermon i got another one or two more points to make on this, on this chapter. And obviously, in you know, the book of Jonah, we see God repenting, and um, the people turn from their evil way, and God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and, and you know, if that's the definition of repentance, it definitely works. But be careful. Don't let these people fool you and play their word games. And, and um, deceive you with even the definition of repent. And that's why it's often important when you're talking to people to, to make sure you understand what they're saying. Because I've also talked to people who will say you have to repent of your sins and be saved who are really saved. They repeat things. They'll say things that, I mean, if you're hearing it from the pulpit, you know, week in and week out, repent of your sins, repent of your sins, repent of your sins. I mean, people who are even saved can just, just blindly just repeat the same thing. Okay, that's why I always question people and try to dig real deep when they say that. I don't automatically just assume that they're trusting in works to be saved because sometimes they're not. Now, most of the time they probably are. Most of the time they, re they really do think you have to just like give up your sins in order to be saved. But not always. I mean, like I said, some people you just don't think about it very much. They don't, they don't consider it a whole lot. And if you're hearing it preached over and over again and people around you are saying it, then, then you'll just say the same thing. And, um, and, and you shouldn't do that. You always, always ought to be careful and, and you know, be careful with the words that you use and the terminology you use. But it's also important then to understand what someone else really believes and try to dig deeper. And, and if you're, it, when you're trying to witness to people, you know, um, ask a lot of questions that will, that will uncover their true belief. That's why I always like using examples, illustrations. Well, what if this were to happen? Would this person be saved? If they put their faith in Christ, you know, and just start asking them all these things. Because then you're going to really get a good understanding, okay, this is what this person believes. As you start giving them situations to where they say, they could say yes or no, um, then, you, then you get a true understanding of, of what they believe. But let's continue on here in, in Acts chapter 11. Look at verse number 19 of Acts 11. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. So this is, these are the people that, that if you remember, when um, Stephen was, was stoned, called upon the name of the Lord, that's when all this great persecution had started. And, um, and they really started just being scattered, and they had to, like, they had to just leave. And, and um, so they went to Phoenice, they went to Cyprus, and they went to Antioch, and they were preaching Jesus. But notice it says here that they were preaching only to the Jews. Because again, there was this, this doctrine was so thick that that um, that they couldn't go unto one of another nation. So that they just they were kind of finding out the Jews and they're preaching. And people were getting saved, you know, they're preaching Jesus Christ, but they're only doing it to the Jews. Look at verse number twenty. It says, "And some of them, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene." So some of these people, it says, were men of. That means they were from these other places. They were already from these foreign countries, which. When they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So they didn't only speak to the Jews. These, these other foreigners that believed, that came from Cyprus and Cyrene, when they went to Antioch, it says they, they started preaching to the Grecians. And um, it says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So one more just proof and evidence that God was truly with this. God wanted them to do this. And the result was there because a great number of people believed when these people were preaching under the Grecians. Let's skip down to verse number 26. It says, 
Well, no, let's just, let's just keep reading. We've got a few more minutes. Verse 22, it says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So they hear all this stuff that's going on in these, in these you know, um, further locations and Cyprus and Cyrene, Antioch, and they decide to send Barnabas to be like, hey, go check this out and see what's going on here. Let's, you know, let's see what's going on in Antioch. It says, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. So now Barnabas goes, he goes back to Tarsus, and he's looking for Saul to bring him over there and be like, hey, look at what's going on in Antioch. Isn't this, you know, isn't this cool? It says that when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So here, Saul, Barnabas, they spent an entire year here. I mean, there was, there was a lot of salvation going on here. The word of God was being preached mightily in Antioch, and people were getting saved. They spent all year there teaching, preaching, soul winning, doing all this stuff. And then notice it says here, this is, this is the first time we see the, the word Christians. That's where, and that's where people were first called Christians, was in Antioch. And notice this too, because today, again, this kind of goes hand in hand with, with understanding what people's definitions are. I was just having a conversation with a lady out soul the other day, and, and um, I was trying to explain, you know, salvation and how we can't lose it. And um, she was saying, well, you know, what about my friend over there? She's a Christian, but then if she decides to go and, you know, do all this sin, and you always got to be careful because, like, my definition of Christian is not somebody who's just going out and, and doing all kinds of sin. Now, I'm not saying they're not saved, but see, I don't think that, that every saved person is a Christian. I think a Christian is someone who is following Christ and is a disciple of Christ. And that's where I get that definition from what we see right here in verse um, 26 at the end there. It says, and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. A disciple is not just a believer. A disciple is someone who's following Jesus. So it says here that the people who were called Christians were the disciples. That's who a Christian really is. Now, I get it. Look, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't really, I'm not a stickler for this when I'm talking to people. It doesn't, I mean, if, if they want to call every saved person a Christian, fine. But I don't think that's a biblical definition, and I don't think that's true. I, when I refer to Christians, I'm talking about someone who, who follows Christ and is doing the works and is doing all kinds of other things, not just someone who put their faith in Christ. But, I mean, I can see where people go both ways. But again, when you're talking to someone, it's important to, to have understanding between yourselves that, you, that you're using the same terminology and, and that you understand exactly what they mean when, when they use a word. Especially a word that, like repent, or even Christian can be used in different ways. And, um, and it, it becomes apparent when you talk uh, about certain subjects and what type of defini definition you're using. Anyways, um, that's not some major doctrine by any means. But just always be careful when you're talking to people that you understand what they're saying. Because again, this is like another, another slick trick of the devil that he'll use to try to get so many people to just kind of agree. He'll use ambiguous words and ambiguous teaching that's kind of broad so that like, um, like the perfect example is repent. Right? So if someone were to stand up and say, you got to repent and believe the gospel to be saved. Well, people on both sides of the fence of that one can listen to that and be like, that's true. Because for one, the Bible says, one of the verses we just turned to, repent and believe the gospel, right? So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But what do you mean by repent? And see, what a lot of preachers will do is they won't ever say what repent means. They won't say one way or the other. They won't go hardcore and be like, you got to give up all of your sins and you got to turn from that wicked lifestyle and you got to just turn to Christ with all your heart and, and, and not go back to that sin. They won't say that necessarily, but they also won't be like condemning that point of view as, as being, you know, as just being works-based salvation. They won't come out and say that either because, well, oftentimes what happens is you got people in the pews that, that think both ways and the easiest way not to step on anyone's toes is to not be very clear about it. But that's not what calls, God has called the pastor to do. You're supposed to make things clear and make things un easily understood and teach these doctrines. And not to allow damnable heresy to spread because that's exactly what that false doctrine is, is a damnable heresy. 
But let's continue on here. We're almost done. Look at verse number 27. It says, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. So again, I mean, people were just kind of coming in here. It was just, Antioch was this big hub for a while where people were coming from Jerusalem. Prophets and preaching. Saul was there. Barnabas was there. It says, And then uh, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, last point here is the end of the chapter. This man named Agabus, and, and, and you know, the first few times I, I read through this, I was just thinking, like, that's kind of odd. Like, like, at first, that verse just, just seems completely out of place. But, uh, but all the rest of the verses here um, go along with that. And there's something we can learn from this, too. So Agabus preaches, and he's signified by the Spirit. So he's preaching through the Spirit of God, right? He's not just going up and saying his, his opinion. So he's signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world. And a dearth is like a scarcity, like, like, like there's going to be a lot of problems, right? And um, it says, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So this came to pass, and this came to pass, like, like in the, this was, this was going to happen soon. And the reign of Claudius Caesar, Caesar was very soon, and it happened in his lifetime. Um, I, I looked it up, and I, and I forget what, what date it was. It was somewhere like between 40 and 50 AD, somewhere in that, in that time reign, when Claudius Caesar was reigning. And, um, and he did, and he persecuted the Jews. And... Um, what, what, I, what I find interesting about this story here is that it says, then the disciples, verse 29, every man according to his ability determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. And Judea was the place where Claudius Caesar was, had, had authority and had to reign over the people there, was in Judea. And they determined to send relief unto them, which means they sent money. They were, they were trying to help them out. What happened is here, they hear the prophet speaking. They recognize it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through them. And they, they, they hear, okay, there's going to be a great dearth. Well, let's do something about it. Let's help these brethren out that are in another area. They have a need. Let's, let's supply their needs with whatever we can. We know this is coming. Let's help them get prepared for what the hardship that's going to be coming ahead, that they were forewarned of God. And again, they didn't just dismiss it. They didn't just come into church, hear the preaching of, of Agabus here, and then just go home and don't do anything about it, right? And this is what we ought to have every single one of us. When the Spirit is teaching, when the Spirit is preaching, you learn something, you hear something, don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. Act on it. I mean, these people, it happened to be a financial need. They acted on it. They said, you know what? There's going to be bad things coming in. Well, let's do something to help them out. Financial needs can be met with, with people who are missionaries, with other people that we know that are going through hard times. Maybe we know something's going to happen that's a hard time. I mean, when we heard, when we heard about um, um, the hardship that, that Pastor Anderson and his family were going through, all kinds of medical bills and all this other stuff, hey, a lot of people decided, but we're going to help him out. There's a hard time that he's facing ahead. Let's help him out. And that's what we're supposed to do as brethren, as Christians, as people of Christ. If someone's far off or if someone's near, you hear about someone who's going through a real difficult time. I mean, it doesn't always have to be financial. It could be anything, though. Whatever way you can help, you ought to do that. You ought to recognize that. And, and don't just, just sit back and do nothing. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. God, I pray that you would please just help us all to be doers of the work. God, I pray that you would please help us to, to withstand this damnable heresy of, of the false repentance of sins to be saved, dear God, where people think that you have to give up a wicked, sinful lifestyle in order to be saved. Lord, I pray that, that we would all give up a, a wicked, sinful lifestyle, that we'd all be perfect and follow you completely, dear Lord. And I know that I'm not trying to downplay our sin by any means, dear Lord, um, but I also recognize the price that you paid and that you get all the credit and you get all the glory and you get all the honor for, for paying for our sins in full and that we're not required to give them up in order to be saved. 
We're just required to believe and put our faith in Christ and what he did for us, dear Lord. And we recognize that. And, and God, help us to fight against these work salvation crowd that, that are teaching a, a, a false doctrine. And Lord, help us to, to be diligent in our Bible reading and our Bible study to be, be paying attention to every word and to read everything in context that we also wouldn't be deceived. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.